I've taught here for many years. I've obviously written a lot of scholarship as well. Um, I've written a lot in the area of mental health law, that area that I first became intrigued with when I was in the Lindsay administration. And that's how I met David Wexler. Um, David, of course, is my therapeutic jurisprudence um, partner. And in my second semester here at the law school, uh, David, who previously was a law professor at the University of Arizona, was here on a sabbatical semester. His mom lived on Miami Beach. And so he, as luck would have it, just was working here. We gave him an office at the law school. He, you know, it was at the office next to mine. We met, we became friends, we went to lunch. We realized we had a common interest in mental health law. Very few people were working in that field at the time. And so we became fast friends and continued that friendship over the years after he went back to Arizona. And, you know, we would meet at professional meetings, at the ALS meetings, at other meetings. We would read each other's individual articles. We would comment on them. Um, and over the years, we began to see a certain common style in our scholarship. Uh, in addition to doing the usual things that law professors do in their articles, you know, crunch the cases, construe the statutes, make constitutional arguments, we always had a section in the article in which we would criticize the law as ironically being anti-therapeutic. Now, this was mental health law. You would think mental health law is designed to facilitate the mental health needs of, of those patients, um, and, and yet, strangely, at times, the law set up um, psychological forces which caused those patients to act dysfunctionally or other me people in the system to act dysfunctionally. So we, we kind of noticed in our individual work that we would do that sort of move, that criticism of a rule of law, a case, whatever, as anti-therapeutic, and we would often, in a constructive way, say, here's how it should be changed to, uh, you know, avoid that dilemma. Anyway, at a certain point in, in, in the middle to late 80s, we decided to call that approach therapeutic jurisprudence. That was a title that neither of us were very happy with. <laughs> it's a highfalutin academic word. Uh, it sounds a bit much. Um, and, and you begin to think, therapeutic jurisprudence, boy, is that an oxymoron? Is it like military music or something? How could the law be therapeutic? But we saw that potential that the law could be therapeutic. And we certainly saw lots of areas in which the law was anti-therapeutic. And in a way, that's what we were doing with our scholarship. And we, we uh, conspired on this book that was published in 1991, Essays in Therapeutic Jurisprudence. And in the intro to that book, you know, it was a book about mental health law, and we, it was really individual essays that we each had or were writing uh, at the time, and it, it basically started out with a little introduction saying th what we're doing in this book is therapeutic jurisprudence, explaining what that meant, and basically it's a very simple notion that the law, whether we know it or not, has inevitable effects on people's emotional well-being. Unfortunately, frequently those effects are negative. Let's understand law's impact in that regard. Let's study law in that regard. Let's consider that dimension of law, previously un unconsidered dimension. And let's see if we can reshape law, reform law, change law, to make it less anti-therapeutic and, when consistent with other important legal goals, more of a force for healing, more of a therapeutic force. Law has therapeutic potential. Let's exploit that. And so it's a, a, an interdisciplinary approach, explicitly interdisciplinary. Let's look at these issues through the tools, with the tools of the social sciences. Let's actually study law empirically. It's, it's uh, you know, a page out of legal realism. And, of course, Soya Menchikov was a major figure in legal realism, which Carl Llewellyn and her and several others really founded. Let's look at law in action, not just law in the books. Let's understand law with the interdisciplinary perspective that we need to see it really. We need to be anthropologists and psychologists and economists and understand all of those dimensions of law, not just see law in some artificial, syllogistic way. 
you know, law as kind of a cardboard cutout. It's not that. It's, it's real people. It's how that law plays out in the lives of people. And so our take is, let's study that dimension of law. Let's think about it, and let's, let's reform it. Um, and, and so that was really what our um, therapeutic jurisprudence uh, uh, field started out. And we started out in mental health law. We said, this is going to be a field that, naturally enough, it will start in, but that it soon will expand to other allied fields of law, juvenile law, health law, criminal law, sentencing law, correctional law, family law, and soon thereafter across the legal spectrum because of course what we were describing wasn't just an idea for mental health law, it was an idea for all of law. Well we published that book and it had an enormous impact on professors within the profession and, and I think here's how it did that in a way. We all were folks who were doing law and psychiatry or mental health law and there were maybe 30, 40 professors in that field at the time and there was a section at the Association of American Law Schools and we started presenting our work and talking about these ideas and of course a law school that had mental health law that was itself you know a bit of a novelty, a bit of a luxury and so everyone teaching mental health law was also teaching other things, torts, contracts, civil procedure, whatever. And so the law professors in mental health law who got that idea began to see applications in the other areas that they taught in and started writing about mental health law, about therapeutic jurisprudence in tort law and contract law and this or that. And so gradually the field expanded and became kind of a mental health approach to law generally. Uh, we began to see therapeutic jurisprudence work looking at legal arrangements across the legal spectrum for how they could be made more therapeutic. Um, and when we talk about how law can be seen to function as a therapeutic agent, we mean not only the rule of law, but also legal practices and procedures and the way legal actors like judges, like lawyers, like police officers play their roles how law is applied, even if you don't change the law, how it's applied by those folks does have important impacts on people's emotional well-being. Now, this was a time when, of course, law and economics was a major force in the law school world, an interdisciplinary way of looking at law that said we should consider the costs of law, we should consider issues of efficiency, and of course we should. but. Those law and economics folks, I think, made the mistake of thinking that efficiency, that cost, was the, the major focus of everything. It isn't. It's one of several important things we should consider. And so we didn't make that mistake. We said, look, to say that a law is anti-therapeutic isn't to say we should change it. It's to say, let's reconsider it. There might be countervailing considerations that cause us to want to keep it anyway, but maybe we can reshape it or tailor it or change it in ways that, that eliminate those anti-therapeutic effects. So um, that's really how therapeutic jurisprudence started, and of course it has spread across the legal spectrum. It's obviously affected judging and lawyering in important ways, this idea of how judges apply their authority, how lawyers apply their power can be seen, they can be seen as therapeutic agents. Um, you know, we did a book in 2003 called um, Judging in a Therapeutic Key, Therapeutic Jurisprudence in the Courts, that describes the problem-solving courts that have emerged in the same 20-year period, uh, starting with drug treatment court right here in Miami. A new way of looking at the problem of, of drug addiction. Is it just a criminal problem that we should have a punitive approach to? Or should we think about how the courts can function to help to rehabilitate people?